The parables of Jesus inspire different responses in us from time to time. Amusement, perhaps, when he tells a funny story. Perhaps reflection, maybe even anger or sorrow. Those are all possible reactions. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus scares me. The rich man in the parable is rich. He's always been rich. In those, in that society, you didn't change your social status. You didn't pull yourself up by your own bootstrap. If you were rich, you were born rich. He's always been rich. And Lazarus? Well, Lazarus, what did he do to be poor? Nothing. In that society, Lazarus was born poor. He had always been poor. By accident of birth, the rich man celebrates inside every day. By accident of birth, Lazarus suffers outside the gate every day. That's the nature of life. That's the way it is. And it kind of scares me. Because it sounds an awful lot like our world. By accident of birth... North Americans are born into incredible comparative prosperity. Yes, I know there, is, there are different levels of affluence and need in our society, but by comparison to the rest of the world, by accident of birth, great prosperity. By accident of birth, some people are born into affluence and opportunity. They speak well, they look good by accident of birth. Some people are born into suffering or need. They aren't terribly attractive. They may be annoying and they don't have all the opportunities. By accident of birth, Lazarus was outside the gate. By accident of birth, the rich man was inside. Now, sometimes it's suggested that the rich man was evil because he was wealthy and Lazarus was righteous because he was suffering and in need. But in the first century, when Jesus first told this story, it would have been the other way around. The listeners would have said that the rich man, because he was rich, was obviously righteous, and the poor man, because he was poor, was obviously sinful. Is either of those right? But don't we often judge by appearance? Now, according to the normal morality of that day, the rich man did nothing wrong. And that might well be the view of some people today. I can imagine the rich man's funeral. I can imagine glowing eulogies to his contributions to the business community and to politics. I can even imagine wonderful stories about how socially concerned he was. And I can assure you that after death, he had a lovely tomb. Let's be clear, even though it may make the parable harder for us. The rich man wasn't unkind to Lazarus. The rich man didn't have him removed from his gate. He didn't kick Lazarus as he went by. It was because of his wealth. It wasn't because of what he did that he ended up in torment. The problem is not unkindness, but blindness. The rich man going about his busy activities, his important work, he just never saw Lazarus. The poor man with his needs, his sores, his hunger, just part of the background, just part of the backdrop against which the rich man went about doing his work. You know, every society pretty well is judged by subsequent generations. And we often judge them for what seemed natural and normal to them. And so we wonder, how is it that generation after generation of good church-going Christian folk could keep slaves? Or we wonder how generation after generation of Christian nations could 
employ the death penalty for so many crimes. Or we wonder how we could live in blissful ignorance while churches administered the residential schools for the government. Now the point of the parable and the point of the sermon is not to make you feel guilty. Sorry if that's what I've been accomplishing. Because guilt doesn't do anything. Guilt by itself is a motivation to change. And if we don't change, God couldn't care less about our guilt. Sometimes we offer guilt to God to say, well, you know, I know I should change, but I really can't, so how about I feel badly about it? Will that do as a substitute? God isn't interested in our guilt. God is interested in us seeing the truth. In life, it's a wall between Lazarus and the rich man. In life, the rich man was on one side of the gate and Lazarus was on the other side. The rich man feasted. This is in a society where most people knew hunger at least part of the time. The rich man feasted every day. The rich man dressed in purple. Purple dye for clothes was hideously expensive. Only royalty and the very rich could afford purple. He's in there having a grand old time and Lazarus is outside and in death things are reversed. Lazarus couldn't help him even if he wanted to. Sometimes things come too late. But the rich man, even in the afterlife, can't see Lazarus as a, as a neighbor. The rich man, did you notice as Harvey was reading, talks sort of as an equal to Father Abraham and, and sees Lazarus as a gopher to go and, and do what the rich man wants him to do. He can't see the connection. And it's really very frightening the number of people in HRM who are one missed paycheck, one lost job, one serious mental health incident from living on the street like Lazarus. And do we see them? When you see a panhandler, do you actually see a person? Even if you don't give them anything, do you make eye contact and treat them as a fellow human being? Or are they just part of the backdrop across which we move? Excuse me. You know, I, I hate to bother you, but could you spare a few dollars for uh, those leftovers? Could, could you spare those leftovers? No. We could pray for you, and I'm sure God will bless you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks a bunch, yeah. Mm. That was just weird, man. Yeah. Okay, bye.
Not today, sweetheart. I'm hungry. sides of the wall. What is it, I wonder, that causes us to have someone or something in our line of sight and we don't see it? Or causes us to see something or someone who's actually there? What gets us through the wall? And the parables of Jesus tell us about the kingdom breaking in in all sorts of surprising ways, so we shouldn't be surprised. After all, God is not under our control. I know, we get used to contrasting wealth and poverty between countries. We're used to seeing poverty on the television in, in Haiti or India or, or Bangladesh or in, or in some other communities in, in Canada. Would it surprise you to know that in Sackville, many of the groups that work with youth say that the biggest issue, the biggest single issue, is food security? The, library, the, the manager of the library over here was talking to me, uh, we were talking last week, he told me about a conversation he had with some youth. In their homes there were no books, there was no computer, there was no access. I know it's not as bad as living on the street and dumpster diving for food, but it's still a wall. Can we see it breaking down? Would it surprise you to know that our Beacon House feeds between 22 and 2,500 people every single month and it gets worse year over year. And that, by a lot of measures, the only place in Canada that is worse for food security is the far north and some First Nations communities in Ontario and Quebec. Would it surprise you to know that of every dollar earned last year, 50 cents of every dollar went into the pockets of one-fifth of our population. Do we see the wall? Can we imagine the gate being open? Our culture is a powerful resistance when it comes to talking about issues of consumption and poverty. You see, the rich man wanted Lazarus to go back and talk to his brothers even if he could have gotten a hearing, and Abraham said no. Abraham said, you know, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. And the rich man said, no, if somebody goes back from the dead, then they will listen. Well, what does that mean? It means that according to this story, you and I are neither Lazarus nor the rich man. We are the five brothers. Because despite Father Abraham, Jesus has snuck the story out to us. And so we have Moses and Abraham, Moses and the prophets, and we also have someone risen from the dead. We've heard the story. We are the five brothers. What happens now? Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and Holy One, help us to not turn away from the difficult words of Scripture, but to see in your, call, in your word a call for how we might ponder the living of our days.